Welcome to Nomad PHP Lightning Talks. I'm Joe Ferguson. Nomad PHP Lightning Talks are 10-minute talks that give a high-level overview or an in-depth look at a small portion of a PHP-related topic. Lightning Talks are a great way for new speakers to build their speaking resume and for long-time speakers to test drive new talk ideas. Right now we have Christopher Pitt, and tonight he's going to be talking about defensive programming. Please make sure you visit Joined In after the talk and leave Christopher some feedback. Christopher, take it away. I'll make you the or the presenter. Okay. So... As Joe mentioned, today I'm going to talk about defensive programming. Uh, the Wikipedia entry on this defines it as ensuring the continuing function of a piece of software under unforeseen circumstances. Now, uh, that's a bit vague, but the idea is that the is that unexpected input and usage can cause our code to break. So defensive programming is really about reducing the potential for breakages, even though we could never write perfect code at a large scale. I'm going to suggest a few things we can try, but before I do, let me give you a very controversial piece of advice, and it is this. Use a framework. Now, there are many reasons for and against this idea. They could and probably should be a talk on their own, but if you agree with anything else I tell you in the rest of this talk, using a framework will be of benefit to you. The good ones do all of what I'm about to tell you. They cover more bases than you can remember to, and have far more people looking at their code than you have looking at yours. Unless you're Taylor Otwell, but even Taylor uses a good framework. The first thing you need to pay attention to is not to trust users. And before we get the wrong idea, uh, when we hear the word users, we tend to think of non-developer types. But a user is really anyone who provides input to a component or an application. It's not a level of skill which separates users from developers. It's whether someone is providing input or writing code to handle that input. That means we're users to everyone else's components and applications. We're even users to our own code if enough time's passed since we created it. Following on from this, we should always, always, always try and filter user content. Malformed input uh, data is is often a pain point for many applications. Maybe. What you're expecting is an integer, but you get a string. Or perhaps you get a badly formatted date or email address. Well, there are some simple tools that we can use to deal with this kind of data. For example, there's the filter var function built into PHP. It's got three, argument, three parameters that you can see here. So the first one's the input data you want to filter. The second is the type of filter you want to apply. And there are a few which we'll talk about now. And the third are any optional flags that you may need to apply to a specific type of filter. While there are many filters for these, many types of these filters provided by this function, the more useful ones I've found are these four. So validate email or IP, regular expression and URL. Uh, but if you're looking for something with a bit more kick, you can check out a project called Respect Validation. The code Examples that you find, they look something like this. So we can create a validation rule that's alphanumeric, specify a length of 1 to 15 characters, and then pass a string in to validate it. There are all sorts of different rules, and they get increasingly complex depending on how long you want to chain this fluent interface. But the basic idea is that you can construct quite a comprehensive uh, map of the data that you want to validate against. Don't get me wrong, though. This isn't just about validating your forms. It's more than that. You can use this stuff to check parameters to internal functions as well. Does the function you're writing expect something that looks like a valid URL? Well, use a filter. These are some links that you can check. The, so the first one is just more examples on that filter var function. And the second is the types of uh, filters that you can apply. And the third is that validation library I've told you about. Following on, use a database abstraction. Forget the days of using strip slashes and MySQL connect. Use an abstraction that will write your queries for you. You don't need to go all the way into ORM land, but you don't need to be writing more SQL queries either. Check out Doctrine or Aura. And if you can't find something that works well with your application, at least use PDO's prepared statements. They'll do a far better job of securing and preventing against all sorts of nasty SQL attacks. Then, we looked at filtering user content, but what about when it's already stored and perhaps stored in a poor state? Well, if you're storing data in a database, uh, then you know the, this is something that you need to watch out for. Have you ever heard the term cross-site scripting? Of course you have. 
That's when, a user, uh, when an application allows users to store markup, and then they store malicious scripts instead, and other users suffer pain and agony because of this. Okay, maybe it's not that dramatic, but you're helping these nefarious types of people by not sanitizing user content. Whenever you need to render user-generated markup, always remove and encode as much as possible before you echo it out to the browser. Strip scripts with the strip tags function, and encode special HTML characters with the HTML entities function. Then, <laughs> don't trust users, but also don't trust developers. So building stronger applications is about more than just dealing with bad input data. It's also about reducing the ways in which your code can be misused by other developers, including yourself. And probably the most important thing you can do in this area is to write tests. A healthy application is a well-tested application. When you don't test, you fear change. Will that new feature cause other parts of your application to break in unexpected ways? How much dead code is just lying around your application code base? How you test and what you test are important questions that I don't really uh, have time to answer for you right now. But if you've never really tested your code and you want to learn how to, then check out grumpylearning.com. But also be prepared to fight for tests. If you want to do it, you've got to fight for it. You'll need to fight the misconception that testing costs more than it's worth. That's wrong. You also need to fight the desire to skip testing just for this project and then just for the next project and then just for the project after that. Write a test today, write a test tomorrow, and soon you'll discover the peace of mind that can only come from knowing your code works because your tests are passing. Another aspect of protecting against developer misuse of your code um, or making code that's just simply not testable is to follow the solid principles. I won't go into very much detail about this because it's also worthy of its own talk time. But for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, a brief description of them is as follows. The single responsibility principle is that classes should do one thing well. So this reduces the reasons for a class to change. The next one, open close principle, is that classes should be open for extension and closed to modification. So in other words, you shouldn't need inheritance to make simple changes to behavior. Following on from that, the Liskov substitution principle, which sounds ridiculous, but it's actually pretty simple. It means that classes should be interchangeable with their subclasses. If you've got a class that has an expected behavior and you create a subclass of that, you shouldn't drastically change what the input variables do, or what the outputs are. Interface segregation principle is that classes shouldn't be forced to implement methods they don't need. So, Interfaces should be focused on that single responsibility. And lastly, the dependency inversion principle, which states that high-level code should depend, shouldn't depend on low-level code or the other way around, but both should depend on abstractions. If you've got a logger, don't use file put contents in it. Rather, depend on a file writer class or, or even just an abstract writer class that will do that low-level code for you so that your logger can focus on its one responsibility. Uh, right, so study these principles and you'll write code that's far easier to test and far safer for you to use in your applications. You'll find some excellent examples of these tutorials at laracasts.com, though it's not a completely free service. You can also read about them uh, in books by Robert Martin, uh, which you can find references to on the site, cleancoders.com. The last thing I want to talk about is type hinting. So PHP is a dynamically typed language. You can use variables without defining what type of data they are, uh, they are expected to hold. You can also change their type at any time. Sometimes PHP will do this automatically in a process called type coercion. So when you compare values and you compare them loosely, well, PHP will convert strings to booleans or booleans to integers, depending on the kind of comparison you're doing. But you can tell PHP what types your functions expect by doing something like this. So here we've got an average function and we tell it that dollar values must be an array because we can see array sum and count both expect arrays. So we just tell PHP what to expect. This works well with arrays and callables and classes and interfaces. But unfortunately, strings, numbers, and booleans can't be type hinted. For that, 
we can use the assert function. So this is just an example of checking whether dollar $source is a string, and if it's not, it's going to echo that error message out. Bearing in mind, a recent RFC has even paved the way for type hinting on return values, which means that interfaces, which act as our contract for behavior for our classes, can not only type hint the kinds of parameters that they expect in their functions, but also the type of data that those functions return. Uh, yes, so that's about all I've got for you tonight. Just some tips and tricks on how to make your code uh, safer to work with, how to make, how to program defensively in order to try and mitigate against unexpected input and behavior. If you've got some feedback, please leave it in on that joined in link, uh, and you can follow me for further stuff on Assert Chris on Twitter. Uh, but thanks. Any questions? Nope, don't have any questions. So thanks for joining us for another Nomad PHP Lightning Talk. If you would like to give a lightning talk, please email me, joe at nomadphp.com. Please make sure you visit joined in and leave Chris some feedback. Thanks.